From the European Parliament here in Brussels, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us tonight and this is what we have for you on the menu. Sell Meyer Smackdown. Does Brussels have a democracy dilemma? Sweden taking a sharp right in the country on the verge of a huge political shakeup. Introducing Bosnia's answer to dirty elections and must-watch TV Vladimir Putin as a reality television star. Brexit as a book. We asked Scottish book lovers to write the ending to this political thriller. Plus, my interview with Yanis Varoufakis. Yes, the bad boy of Greek politics. He's back. Well, thank you for joining us on Raw Politics. It's time to meet the panel tonight. I'm joined by Darren McCaffrey, our political editor here at Your News. Darren, which of the stories do you like best? Well, I think, Tess, it has to be Sweden. We're going to see what probably a familiar tale uh, this weekend about the rise of the right in Scandinavia. But what I think we need to focus on is a slightly more complicated story also about the fall and the failure of the centre. All right. We're also joined tonight by uh, Sophie Intervelt, a Liberal MEP from the Netherlands. Which of the, these stories do you like best? Well, initially I thought the story about Putin because I'm quite intrigued by Putin and reality in the same sentence. Uh, but then I think ultimately I'll opt for the, the Brexit story because right. that, that affects real people. Indeed. And a lot of debate there. And what about to you, Lorenzo Consuli, your EU correspondent for ASCA News Agency, an Italian news agency. Which ones do you like? Uh, certainly the Selmayr story, because we have been following that for uh, quite a number of months now from the Brussels uh, press corps. And uh, this is an important development today, what happened today. Indeed, big news today. We'll be talking about that, all that coming up. But first, our top story, a verifiable gift to any and all Eurosceptics and critics. Because when you hear people in France or Italy or Greece or the UK complain about the way this town runs... This is what they're talking about. That's right. We're talking about Martin Selmayr, the EU's most senior civil servant. But even if you don't know the name, you may recognize what he's come to represent. Selmayr used to be Jean-Claude Juncker's top aide until March when he was promoted to Secretary General of the European Commission, seemingly without any competition and little to no formal process. Well, today, the EU ombudsman released the results of a five-month investigation, saying the commission stretched and possibly even overstretched limits of the law by fast-tracking Selmayr's promotion. Well, that he was not qualified to fill the position without first having served as Deputy Secretary General. But despite the strong language in the report, there were no consequences, just recommendations. And if you want to get a sense of what Europeans think of Selmayr, look no further than the editorial cartoons. Over recent months, they were poking fun, not just at Selmayr and Commission, but calling into question democracy itself, transparency and trust in the EU institutions. We're looking at those uh, cartoons there, this one comparing uh, democracy in the EU to democracy in China over there. And I think it says, uh, ni vu, ni connu, out of sight, out of mind. And this one, I can't really see that, but again, <laughs> making fun, poking fun at the situation there. Uh, wh what do you think? I'll start with you, Darren. Uh, this story, big news today here in Brussels. Yeah, it is big news because it matters to people inside uh, this parliament and indeed inside the bubble, but it also speaks, I think, of a wider story, a wider narrative uh, about the European Union, how it functions and how potentially people feel disconnected from it. Because, you know, who has heard of this man? Most people in Europe have not heard of this man. Uh, but it is how his appointment's been dealt with and indeed, actually, I think the reaction to the criticism that speaks quite loudly. Uh, we have to remember that Martin Silmar is, has been a very dominant force uh, in this commission. Uh, as you say, being Jean-Claude Juncker's uh, chief of staff. Um, but he's kind of almost now detached himself with this job uh, that he currently has. But it is also a sign of how he has run uh, the institution of the commission. Uh, through a combination, yet yeah, of skill, uh, which he undoubtedly has and some political nous. Um, you know, he is uh, a policy factory. I don't think anyone would deny that. But also through fear uh, and a very strong grip on power. Yeah, and Lorenz, I want to go to you because you have been here as a journalist covering Brussels for a long time. And this story for you, it's quite close to, to, to you. Tell us about what you think. Well, the situation is now uh, dangerously similar, similar to what happened with the Santer Commission in 1999 uh, when uh, a, a series of scandals, which were, I think, less serious than this, 
uh, actually pulled down the commission. The commission decided to, to have an en on mass resignation. Uh, of course, everything will depend on how the, the European Parliament will react. Uh, we can ask Sophie Interveld, who was one of the most, uh, uh, you know, the strongest. Yes, indeed. Uh, Having said that, before I go to you, Sophie, I think we have to, to show our viewers uh, this impassioned speech you gave. I think it was in uh, 2018 in March, to be precise. Let's watch this. I am left completely speechless at the scene of 28 powerful politicians selected to, uh, for the political leadership of this continent, but led by the nose by a civil servant. The political commission of Mr. Juncker sheepishly signing on the dotted line. Yes, Mr. Oettinger, that's what you've been doing. You are clearly upset there. Tell us about that. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I was, and I am very uh, upset. Uh, incidentally, looking at the cartoons, I think Mr. Selmayr is probably the European equivalent of Sir Humphrey Appleby. Or what's um, it called? It's called the, the monster of the Berlin <laughs> yeah. and uh, the Rasputin of Brussels. Uh, yeah, no, but, but seriously, the, the report that was issued today by the Ombudsman was actually the reply to a complaint that my party has mm. uh, submitted, because I think it's unacceptable. Um, my party was actually quite disappointed that, um, the, let's say, the bark of the European Parliament was certainly um, uh, worse than its bite. I think, what, would you what would you have wanted well, I, to see? I think disappointment should have been undone. I mean, the, the way it was done, I mean, the, the, the report of the Ombudsman leaves no doubt about it. This was all prepared. It was deliberate. Uh, it was, you know, as they say, parachuted into, into power, uh, ignoring all the rules. And even if they claim that they respected, uh, the, let's say, the law, they may have respected the letter of the law, but certainly not the will, spirit of the law. Will your party push for, 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 for a greater, let's say, punishment for this? Will you, will you push this forward? Well, you know, if it's up to me, yes, I think this is this this would have been a question of uh, confidence in the European Commission because it is about this is not just about the job of Mr. Selmayr. This is about the political judgment of the European Commission. We are less than one year away from the uh, from the elections, and I think uh, everybody everybody has some explaining to do. I would like to make one remark, you know, because look, this is not. This kind of uh, uh, jobs for the boy schemes, that's not the monopoly of the European Union. No? This exists everywhere. But we're in the glass house. We are being watched more closely than any other public institution. Uh, and we have to make absolutely sure that we get it right, that nominations and appointments are transparent and fair, and that we, we appoint people for their their skills and, and their knowledge and not because of... Indeed. And, and I'd just like to, to, to point out that we did try to get uh, Martin Selmayr to join us today in the programme and uh, he had declined. And Darren, you were at the midday briefing. Uh, today you managed to get a question in. Let's listen to that before we go to you. Given the fact that the Ombudsman this morning has said that the EU Commission stretched and possibly overstretched the limits of the law, uh, shouldn't Martin Selmayr do the right thing and step down and reapply for that job? We have received the report. While we do not share all aspects of the underlying report, we welcome that the Ombudsman, based on the extensive material that she received from us, neither contest the legality of the appointment procedure of the Secretary General, nor the choice of the candidate, who is described as a competent EU official, high committed, highly committed to the European Union. I'm sorry, in the I'm, sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt you. In the Commission press room, you have to ask for the floor and then I will give it to you. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, because given that this commission is, it really focuses on transparency, right, what is going to change? This is pretty damning, this, uh, this report this morning. Is anything actually going to change? We, of course, we look into the Ombudsman's recommendation and looks forward, we will look forward to reassess together with the European Parliament and the other institutions how the application of the current rules and procedures can be improved in the future and applied, I repeat, applied in the same manner to all institutions. All right, quick comment on that, Darren, today. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, it was a very, very testy, tetchy uh, press conference. Clearly, the European Union's spokes the Commission spokesperson uh, was being attacked roundly uh, by journalists. The way that he's communicated the story is also under uh, test. Uh, but second of all, his main defence seemed to be, um, well, ultimately, this hasn't made a difference. He quoted a figure that said that support and trust for the EU institutions, including the Commission, had gone up under mm. the Selma uh, affair. 
And I think that just shows the sign of the disconnect that, yeah, yeah. you know, people don't know who this man is. They're not aware of this story. Uh, but this does talk about transparency. This is a commission that repeatedly says it wants to be transparent. And in this case, as great as Martin Sal Salma might be, as the most appropriate man he may well be, and there are lots of people who say he is. He's a very good operator in many regards. The whole point is the process has process. not been clear. And, and let's just bring in the response of the European Commission, Günther Oettinger, the Commissioner for Budget and Human Resources. He said, at first glance, we do not see any reason why the appointment of the Secretary General should be carried out independently from the appointment of any other Director General. Let's just get you to react to that quickly. Well... Uh, I, I agree with you on the issue that they, they seem to be uh, uh, in, a, in a state of denial. Uh, the, the problem is this is clearly uh, something that uh, is harming the reputation of the Commission. The Ombudsman says that also. It has harmed the reputation of the Commission. This should be a glass transparent house, as uh, you were saying. And, uh, uh, the fact that the rules have not been respected, or if they've been respected, they've been respected uh, by passing them in some way, because uh, uh, what is clear uh, from this uh, uh, report is that uh, everything was organized, pre-organized. Yeah, and, I, and think, I think what I'd like to bring to the debate is the fact that this gives ammunition to people who are very skeptical of how Europe works and how democracy works uh, here in, inside yeah. the EU, you know it from the inside, you know, there's already a lot of, of criticism. What more can you add to just very quickly on, yeah. onto this? No, I, I repeat what I just said. I mean, you know, this kind of uh, jobs for the boys uh, exists uh, anywhere also in the EU member states, but that's not an excuse. We need to get it right. This is all about credibility and accountability. This is not about, you know, the Commission's got it all wrong when they're talking about, uh, uh, you know, whether the rules have been followed to the letter. This is about being credible to the European citizens. Mm. This is about, you know, the emperor's new clothes. They keep saying like, oh, look at our, our, our beautiful clothes and, and everybody can see they're naked. Um, so, you know, this is about trust and confidence. Yeah. Right, there, well, there is another thing which is important. He has also centralized, hyper-centralized the whole uh, civil uh, servant uh, uh, structure of the commission. And this is a problem because the commission is now under a sort of terror regime. The commission, the functionals, the, the civil servants Strong living way. there mm. because he mm. controls everything. Mm. And the only thing that he, he doesn't control is I Ukraine. think that brings us to the point of the state of democracy here. So I, I'm just going to go to, because our correspondent uh, Maeve McMahon, she did go to parliament to ask uh, people here about the state of democracy. Just how democratic is the European Commission? One of the questions we're pondering in Brussels today and the one I'm pondering, members of the European Parliament today. I don't see any problem with that. I mean, uh, we have the European Parliament, which is uh, elected through uh, universal uh, elections. Uh, we have the Council, which uh, is composed of the representatives of member states that are elected in their respective member states in a democratic way. And we have the European Commission, which is simply uh, a collection of bureaucrats. I think it's uh, pretty transparent, but I think the European Commission uh, could really improve its transparency. And I think the recent nomination of uh, Martin Solmeyer really proved it, that uh, the Commission uh, should be aware that we have to deal with citizens and that we need to explain to our voters also the procedures. I know there were a lot of concerns about uh, the way he was appointed and the speed at which it was done. If he was the best man for the job, then I think it might have been better to, which he probably was. It might have been better if there would have been more time taken on it. But I'm not sure any rules reached. But at the same time, it's always better to get people on side so that there would be no questions afterwards. If people are in power, they think also they have the right to do what they would like to do. And also to bring someone in a position also, when it's clear that they will leave this post in the future, um, who could, um, yeah, as, as, a, as a symbol for to say thank you to these people. All right, uh, Darren, I'll give you the last word on this topic. 30 yeah, seconds. I just think there are uh, some things we can take from this. First of all, uh, there is some form of scrutiny from the European Parliament. Uh, the Ombudsman has at least shown some teeth today. So I think the European Union, as an institution, and the people who believe in it, can take some hope from that. But... 
the whole point is what happens next. Because if there is no accountability, if nothing does change, well, then that scrutiny is kind of lost. And that, and that is the whole point. That is, I think, potentially what the Commission is going to have to try and deal with. All right, we'll just have to leave the topic. Uh, can, can, ten just, seconds, though. Yeah, just ten seconds. I think this is all, because it's, it's a very unpleasant situation, but it's also part of uh, the European Union becoming more mature and, and grown up as a political uh, union and a parliamentary democracy. And hopefully learning from the yeah. experience. All right. Can, can I, I think it is really important now that the Parliament reacts. I expect the Parliament to take an initiative on this. We are going to have probably uh, uh, European, European elections in which uh, anti-European anti -European, uh, parties will win. We need to see that the Parliament is defending the rule of law, mm. the democracy, and the, the rules, the rules of the EU and the EU institutions. Clearly a lot to say on this topic, and I'm sure a lot more people uh, are going to be commenting on today's news on Martin Selmayer. And coming up on Raw Politics, we have a lot more. We will take you now to Sweden, because if you believe recent polls, the leftist utopia is about to swing right. Plus, he rode into Greek politics on a motorcycle. Now, Yanis Varoufakis <laughs> is trying to run down the right-wing populists of Europe. My conversation with him is coming up. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, Hungary, Poland, Austria, Italy, week by week, more and more European countries are swinging to the far right. Now, it may well be the turn of Sweden. The Nordic nation is heading to the polls this weekend for what's shaping up to be an unprecedented election. Polls are consistently putting the far right Sweden Democrats in second position in the parliament. But according to a new report, the vote has attracted some unwanted and unwelcome attention. Well, let's head to our social media hub. The Cuber Alex uh, is waiting for us. Alex, uh, what do you have for us on this topic. Beware the bots, Tessa and team. I think that's the uh, takeaway from this research. Let's get straight into it and show you exactly what it has said. It's research from a Swedish government agency. And let's just show you. They um, showed activity by bots, which are automated accounts posing as genuine users. So the idea here is to fool you and I. Um, those Bots, their activity increased at almost double between July and August, ramping up as Sweden prepares to go to the polls. That election, of course, is this weekend. Now, almost 600,000 tweets were analysed in this research, and they found that uh, bots were 40% more likely to support the right-wing uh, Sweden Democrats than ordinary, genuine users. Now, that is uh, a really significant point there. These bots expressing a right-wing leaning in favour of that party. In fact, this research can be broken down once again to show you exactly who these bots are favouring. Among the bots themselves, 47% favouring and talking about the right-wing Sweden Democrats. A surge of activity in the run-up to the election from these bots in favour of that party. Now, this research came from the uh, Swedish uh, government agency, the Defence Research Agency, and that they're saying here that they've been aware of you know, concerns about interference, but it is key. This research does not attribute blame to any country. It doesn't say who's behind the bot. It does say the activity has, as you can see there, really ramped up, but it's not clear who is behind it. Now, thousands of civil servants have been trained by the Swedish authorities to work in spotting the signs of interference. There's also been leaflets and documents sent to ordinary people as well, as including school children and younger people, about information to spot this kind of interference in the election. But the key takeaway here, Tessa, is that the bots are back, the bots are active, and it's not to be fooled by a lot of the posts you might be seeing on social media. All right, thank you for that, Alex and the Cube team. Now, when people think about Sweden, many think about a liberal utopia and a moral superpower. So they might be surprised to learn that the Sweden Democrats, a far-right party, could deliver the political shakeup of a century. Well, we decided to head to Sweden to find out what was driving a surge in support for the far-right. Here's your news correspondent, Stefan de Vries. Sweden, a happy social paradise on the edge of Europe. It is larger in size than Austria and Germany combined, but with just over 10 million people, it is a prosperous country, as solid and as reliable as the cars they built. But lately, Sweden's image has taken a hit. You look at what's happening last night in Sweden. Sweden! Who would believe this? Sweden! In certain suburban neighborhoods, there are riots and drug trafficking. Once welcoming to foreigners, some political parties now use crime as an argument to stop all immigration. While neo-Nazis are marching freely in the streets of Stockholm, a lot of Swedes are worried about the rise of the extreme right in their country. 
I'm here because I'm an anti-fascist and anti all this and because I lost almost all my family the last time it happened, I'm sorry. We have difficulties keeping the country together. We got bigger gaps between the poor and the rich ones and then in those times these uh, parties grow bigger because people have something to be angry about. Like every time the history repeats itself. People are afraid of uh, change and we have change. People are a little bit uh, confused and co afraid, uh, which you have seen in a lot of European countries and now you see it in Sweden as well. If they w want to work and or study and learn Swedish, it's okay, but if you're a criminal, I say big no. The star of the far right is Jimmy Arkesson, a former web designer from the south of the country. His Sweden Democrats could come in second this Sunday, but that doesn't mean Arkesson will take over the country. Do you see yourself as the new prime minister in a couple of weeks of Sweden? Um, not, not likely. Uh, I think um, it's possible, uh, but not in, in a few weeks. The Sweden Democrats are against immigration and see their country going down the drain. We have really serious problems in Sweden. Sverige slits isär. Vi slits isär genom att det skapas parallella samhällen kring våra städer, segregation, splittring. Vi slits isär genom att otryggheten ökar, organiserad brottslighet, gängbrottslighet, våldtäkter, skjutningar. One of the hot topics in this election campaign is the supposed link between violence and immigration, and then especially in the suburbs of the larger cities. Most of these neighborhoods are actually quite close to the center, like here in Stockholm, and only a short metro right away. So let's go there and have a look what it is like there. This suburb was built in the 1970s. More than half of the people here come from countries like Iraq, Iran, Somalia, but also from European countries like Poland, Greece and former Yugoslavia. Today there's a neighborhood party and a lot of politicians are campaigning. We run into the Social Democratic President of this district of 60,000 inhabitants. He came here in the 1990s as a refugee from Bosnia. Elvir is up for re-election and the potential success of the far right worries him. With extremism on the rise in Sweden, it's very important that we get as many people as possible to vote and push back this extremism. We will not work with them, they will run their campaign, we will run ours. It's important for us to win this election so that we can run this country. It's very important. So what's happening in Sweden? We decided to ask a political scientist from Gothenburg University. Maybe it's a sort of a slow developing explosion in a way. The key point is of course immigration. We can also see that those who opt for them because of their immigration standpoint also to some extent are sort of more socially conservative. So they sort of mobilize a group of society which is not a majority but it's but it's not a small minority either. The welfare state the Swedes are so proud of is no longer an example to other countries. Sweden is changing and following the trend of other European countries in a shift to the right. But to what extent will be clear next Sunday. Well, joining me to discuss the situation in Sweden is our political editor Darren McCaffrey and the author of the report, Stefan De Vries. Stefan, I'll go to you first. You were there. Tell us about the mood on the ground and put it in context for us. Well, people are very worried about the rise of the far right, of course, but at the same time, Sweden is one of the most successful countries in, in Europe. Uh, it has uh, very low unemployment, people are relatively rich, um, so they're, they're basically confused by the fact that they're now actually becoming a real European country. So, of course, we spoke to a lot of people, we will show another report tomorrow, and tomorrow we'll talk about something very specifically Swedish, it's called the resignation syndrome. It's actually 
children of asylum seekers who get in some kind of coma because their uh, application has been rejected. And this is only limited to Sweden. So it's a very, um, a very touching report. Um, and you, it's very specific uh, it's as It's very well, specific. Uh, and it shows one of the, 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 the sides of European political uh, asylum politics. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, Darren, quickly, I, will, I want to give you... So what do you think about what's happening? Yeah, Sweden, I think Darren, when we look at Sweden, we'll see this Sunday. As I say, it's a tale that we have seen before. As you say, in many regards, it's, it's Sweden becoming much like the rest of Europe. And yet we do talk about the rise of the right, and that is really important. But we also should be clear that the right isn't necessarily uniformed across uh, Europe. But what is also interesting, and something that people should focus on, and we will do over the next few days, is it is also the fall and the failure of the centre. Um, and that's not being talked about enough. And the fragmentation of politics, which we'll see this weekend in Sweden, Indeed. replicated elsewhere. And we will be following uh, the story, the Swedish story, until the elections. Now, as politicians return from their summer break, a lot has been happening with Brexit. Let's get up to speed with a Brexit brief. Strange bedfellows. Arch Brexiteer Jacob Rees Mogg and ultra Europhile Michel Barnier may be polar opposites on Brexit, but it seems they have finally found something in common. They both dislike Theresa May's checkers plan. The pair met in Brussels yesterday at a meeting of the UK's Brexit Select Committee and the European Commission. Meanwhile, in London, hundreds of civil servants have negotiated their own exit and have ditched the department responsible for negotiating Brexit. 357 staff have left the department for exiting the EU over the last two years, bringing the total number of staff to 665, according to the UK's independent newspaper. That indicates a turnover rate of more than 50%. And 600 kilometers away in Scotland, it seems Brexit could boost support for the breakup of the UK. If Brexit goes ahead, 47% of Scots would vote in favor of separation, while 43% would opt to keep ties with London. That's according to the latest polling, which will come as welcome news to the Scottish nationalists who lost the 2014 vote on Scottish independence. Yeah, and staying in Scotland for a moment, as we saw there, there could be a Brexit boost support for independence. And while we were there recently at the Edinburgh International Book Festival, we found a way to ask the Scottish people what they think on of Brexit negotiations. Let's take a look. A modern tragedy. I think maybe some very long fantasy horror story. Mm, I think it would be a comedy. It would be a disaster story. I think I would put it in the horror section. I think it would be a thriller. The most appalling kind of Greek tragedy you could ever imagine. I think the opening line would be uh, looking for Nirvana. In the beginning, there was a very fine and fantastic Europe. The Boris bus pulled into town promising the world. It all seemed like a good idea. <laughs> My God, this is the worst of times. There is no best of times. The hero would be, I, I think, Michel Barnier. The hero of the book would be our first minister, Nicola Sturgeon. I think the hero of this book would be the British people, collectively, as a nation. There are very few heroes, there are many villains. Well, it has to be David Davies, Boris Johnson, Liam Fox. The villain of all those who were peddling falsehood. Uh, Mr Farage, Mr Johnson. There's only one villain, really, and that's, that is the... Uh, the Tory Prime Minister, David Cameron. The people like Barney and Junkers, I think, who run it on a, on a political ideology as opposed to what I think should be the best interests of all 27 nations. Two villains, maybe, Boris Johnson and Michael Gove. Europe carries on happily and the UK sinks into more and more chaos. And that is how Brexit ends. With a free Scotland, free and independent Scotland, that's how it ends. It ends with rejoicing in the streets, the villages, the pubs throughout Europe. As we all come together again, as Robert Burns so eloquently said, 
as one family of man, for we are brothers for all that. Well, there we have it. But uh, first, let's take a, a break on raw politics. After the break, I'll sit down with Yanis Varoufakis to talk about the rise of the right and what he's hoping will be a renaissance of the left. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now we turn to anti-establishment sentiment in the far left corner of Greek politics. Yanis Varoufakis, academic turned politician, became the poster boy for resistance against the EU's push for austerity in times of crisis. Now his time in power was brief, but we haven't seen the last of him yet. I caught up with him recently to find out what's going on with democracy, his thoughts on Steve Bannon and much more. You know, you're here, you're speaking at a series called Killing a Democracy. So is it dead? No but it's the most fragile of flowers. It's so very easy to, to crumble it and to crush it. And unfortunately, after the 2008 crisis, which is still with us, uh, we are having the political disintegration on both sides of the Atlantic of liberal, liberal democracy and democratic values and processes. People voted for you for a certain reason. And I think people voted for your party at that time because they were fed up with everything else. And now we're looking at people voting to the right to the, to the other side, to the far right. That's not what we were saying. What we were saying is people staying on their couch, in their homes, and uh, being completely uninterested in politics. Uh, what is winning is abstention, uh, apathy, depoliticization. That is what's winning. And there is a profound difference between the vote that we received in January 2015 and the vote of the referendum in July 2015, that magnificent 60 percent. And votes after that. People now vote uh, passively. They are voting, they are trying to work out what is the least bad alternative. Is that why you think people are voting right now in different countries? You've got Italy, you've got uh, Sweden possibly now going in that direction and you have Steve Bannon coming into Europe saying well I'd like to reunite the, that part right. Do you think that's since why that trend is happening? Since 2000, 2006 I've been giving lectures and I've been writing articles warning that the great financial crisis equivalent to 1929 is going to hit the West. And that was indeed the 2008 crisis, our generation is 1929. And that if we pretend and extend the, that crisis and introduce austerity for the many and socialism for the bankers, which is exactly what we did, we are going to unleash demonic political forces that will recreate a postmodern 1930s with a nationalist quasi-fascist international rising up both in the United States and Europe. This is exactly what has been happening. Are we there now? Are we there yet? Oh, absolutely. Well, I'm joined again by our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, Dutch uh, Liberal MEP Sophie Intvelt, and Lorenzo Consoli, EU correspondent for ASCA News Agency. Darren, I'll put this to you. Strong words from Yanis Varoufakis there. Uh, yeah, strong words and an interesting thought process. I mean, I would counter it slightly by the fact that actually we are seeing the rise of the popular right uh, in countries that are doing pretty well, actually. So, OK, we saw Golden Dawn in Greece um, when there was the uh, crisis there, what, five years uh, ago. But we're seeing the rise of the right in places like Germany. Unemployment hasn't been, it's historically low in Germany. It's got incredible growth. It's doing very well successfully. And this is a challenge. Why is the rise of the right still happening when actually people are still and are now relatively well off? Is it because they resorted to identity politics? And we're seeing the rise of the right because of identity politics, mm. essentially because of immigration. And that, again, is nothing new. I, I mean, it's interesting, 1666, the Great Fire of London, burned down half the city. There were riots the day after, days afterwards. Why is that? Because they blamed migrants for starting the fire. That's not new. What is new, though, is I think the sheer scale the sheer widespread scale that we've seen of the rise of the right across Europe. All right, he has more to say. Let's, let's just hear a little more uh, from Yanis about these uh, demonic forces, as he called them. Something demonic, but they see Yes, it's the postmodern 1930s. Yeah, but this is, they say, it's people voting because this is how they really feel. You don't believe that? Absolutely believe in that. And this is our tragedy. It is our failure. Whose uh, failure? It is a failure of the liberal democratic establishment. It is a failure of people like us on the left who failed to unite and put forward uh, a program for a new deal, something like the FDR's New Deal. Uh, our movement, DiEM25, is trying to do that. We have a new deal for Europe. But 
and this is why I'm here, this is why I go all over Europe. We will be contesting the uh, European Parliament elections in 10, in 11 different countries in May 2009, but we have not succeeded in opposing this national, this international. Don't forget that Mussolini and Hitler won the support of um, a majority of people in their countries, tragically, but they did. Not because they promised concentration camps or the war, but they promised to give them back their dignity, to help them take their country back. Does this remind you of anything? What do you think of Steve Bannon? He is uh, a very smart representative of a neo-fascist movement that has international ambitions that we must defeat. We have an obligation to the next generation to defeat Steve Bannon and this nationalist, neo-fascist internationality. Are you playing catch-up though? Because he seems to be... As we did in the 1930s. And in the 1930s we lost and we had a Second World War. This time we should learn from the 1930s and move ahead. You know, when, when you speak about um, establishment, changing the EU, uh, it has to be revamped or even demolished at some point. Um, not demolished. Okay, but I do revamped. not believe in demolition jobs. But then at the I same believe, time... I believe in uh, uh, rationalizing and democratizing the European Union. But you are an outsider and anti considered anti-establishment. Do you agree with that? Thankfully. So, do you think that you probably have more in common with the likes of Steve Bannon than you think? No. What happens, look, Think of Goebbels in the 1920s, fiery speeches against the financial establishment in the 1920s that brought Germany and the Weimar Republic down. Yeah? Some of the points that he was making were very anti-establishment, they're actually quite accurate. And then on page three of the speech, you went into a toxic, anti-Semitic rave about how Germany will become better off if they kill the Jews, right? Now that is what we're facing with the Nationalist International today. They use the language of anti-establishment rhetoric in order to grab the establishment and turn it against the people. We should want, as Democrats, to expand the realm of democracy and to bring rationality and prosperity for the crushing majority of people. Sophie, I'll go to you as a liberal MEP. He says it's a death of liberal democratic establishment. Is that fair? No, I think he's being a bit too pessimistic and alarmist here. Uh, he's right in one thing, and that is democracy will not defend itself. We have to protect it, uh, for example, by, you know, voting, by using our voting rights. But I, I think he's wrong on one point. The cause of this is not economics, as, as you also said, because there are lots of people who are very well off, countries that are very prosperous, where these authoritarian forces are on the rise as well. I think the core of their message is a very different one. It has something to do with identity, but not just with immigration. It has something to do with the changes in the social order. They have a kind of joint international manifesto, which is called Restor uh, Restoring the nat Natural Order. And the natural order is, of course, that the white, middle-aged, heterosexual, Christian male is, you know, on top of who's the... Been, who's yeah. been dominant for so long. Who's been dominant for so long. Now has to observe that there's, for example, a black man in the White House. Sure. There could have been a woman in the White House, a woman running the IMF, a Muslim mayor of London, a, a gay son of yeah. immigrants being prime minister like of to, Ireland. To, that, to, that is the real To bring it to Lorenzo, government. because in Italy, very quickly, we don't have much time. Lorenzo, in your country, you said that there's no more left as well. Well, the, the, there is uh, some left, but it's uh, in, in very, very bad conditions. Uh, if you consider that at the last uh, European elections, uh, the Partito Democratico got 40% of votes, and now they are, they are fighting to get to, to, to stay uh, below the 10%. Uh, what happened to all these voters? Where did they go? Mm. And uh, most of them went to Cinque Stelle, but Cinque Stelle is not leftist, a leftist movement. Sure. Uh, it's, there, it, there are some elements of the left, but it's not a leftist movement. So what happened? I don't agree with one thing that uh, uh, Mrs. Interval right, said, which Tell is uh, that the economy has nothing to do with this. Actually, I didn't the, say nothing, actually, no. the economy, <laughs> actually, the economy, I mean, the, the austerity, and that's where Varoufakis is absolutely right, has uh, taken away the legitimacy to the EU institutions. The EU institutions are now in the, the right. lowest uh, possible level of uh, consensus okay. by people because of the austerity in most of the countries, not in and Germany. We decided to have to leave that discussion here, but we're running out of time. And it's now time for uh, tonight's raw moment.
This uh, October, voters in Bosnia will head to the polls. The government there is under pressure to reform elections and ensure that they are fair and transparent. By the way they are going about it is attracting all the wrong kinds of attention. Alex, tell us about the story. Tessa, how's this for election transparency in perhaps the most literal form? Here are the ballot boxes unveiled. They are now transparent boxes. These boxes backed by the US, the UK and uh, Norway as well. Uh, so uh, getting involved here, aiming to have transparency quite literally at the ballots uh, when it comes to the vote in Bosnia next month. Now, why is this happening and why is it on the US embassy's website? Quite literally, a big press conference was held and all the world's cameras were invited. So this is happening because there are concerns that the ballots in the country's election will be interfered with. People are worried about transparency. The old boxes are steel. You can't see in them. The idea is these new boxes will get over that fear. Why the foreign involvement? Well, there's been concerns among Western countries that Russia is trying to influence the election and get involved in the polls if they can. So this, again, a statement from Western countries. They stand behind the election process. Not everyone's taking it deadly seriously, though this user here saying he's going to donate his Tupperwares should they uh, need them to help the vote. This one here saying, a Bosnian user uh, based outside the country, saying, well, look, I put useless things in my see-through boxes. Maybe that's how the Bosnian government views my vote. So maybe just to end on actually a serious point, somebody here saying it's ridiculous that in order to get a transparent election in this country, people are focusing on boxes. What they should be focusing on is the whole process itself. So it is getting people talking, Tessa. Thank you for that, Alex and the Cube team. And thank you for joining us on Raw Politics tonight. Don't forget to join us again tomorrow, same time, same place. Bye for now.